Addictions touch even the best Christian families right here in San Diego. This is Recovery Radio San Diego with Todd Cunningham of Pacific Hills Treatment Center and Recovery Options Network, along with John and Leslie Savage on KPRZ weekdays at 6.30 p.m. Stay with us for real-life stories, help from Christian experts, what works and what doesn't work, and local area resources for you and your family. Sponsored by John Savage. Welcome to Recovery Radio San Diego. Good evening. You're listening to 1210 AM KPRZ, a brand new radio program about addictions and self-destructive behaviors and God's plan for you with recovery. Welcome to Recovery Radio. My name is John Savage, and I am a grateful recovering alcoholic and addict. And I am one of three members of this new local ministry here on K-Praise Radio. Recovery Radio is a daily program that's heard Monday through Friday at this time, and its sole mission is to assist addicts and their families with local professional resources so that they can get the help they need to live a healthy and productive life glorifying God in all that they do. And in studio with me today is my wife, Leslie, and Todd Cunningham from Recovery Options. We also have a special guest that we'll announce in just a moment. He's our guest all week. We're talking about family issues, and so we'll introduce him in just a moment. Good afternoon, Todd. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me and today and all the other and days. Every day. Yes. Recovery Options. What is Recovery Options? Because it's important. We want to make sure that we give the telephone number out and your role with Recovery Options. Okay. I've been working with Recovery Options for about six years. I kind of head the department. We have um, an average of five crisis counselors that are answering the phones seven days a week. Um, what we do is we receiving calls, uh, probably about 100 to sometimes 200 calls a day. From people that have family members or them themselves are addicts or alcoholics looking for help. They range from people that have no home or family to the elite people that you might consider in, in Hollywood that are very wealthy. Call us and, and we help run through questioning them on what they're going through and doing an um, assessment and determining what they need and helping them find the services that they need. And one of our, our sponsors of this program is Pacific Hills Treatment Center, and which is a Christian treatment center just up the road in San Juan Capistrano. We haven't spoken too much about Pacific Hills, but provide us with a, a brief detail of Pacific Hills. Well, Pacific Hills was started about three years after Recovery Options was started. Um, they, the owners, Rick Jackson and Kirby Dean, seen that there needed to be a Christian drug and alcohol treatment center that was professionally run. And so they started Pacific Hills. Pacific Hills has three uniquenesses about it. Number one is DNA is Christian. They started out as a Christian company, and the decisions that they make make and what they, how they perform their services are all in line with Scripture. Number two, they consider dual diagnosis, and dual diagnosis means that if somebody has a psychological issue, maybe something as simple as depression, anxiety, um, all the way through ADHD, ADD, and you know something that's psychological, that they're able to provide drug and alcohol treatment and be aware of these situations and provide the addiction treatment at the same time working with the uh, dual diagnosis. Um, what type of programs do you offer up there uh, at Pacific Hills? We offer um, alcoholism treatment, drug addiction treatment. Um, we provide residential where you come in and stay with us for 30 days. Uh, we have a transitional care that's after that that's for an additional 30 days, which Norm, our guest here, supervises and directs that program. And so that's the treatments that we provide. Very good. Okay, so throughout this uh, program, we want to make sure that if you're struggling with a drug or alcohol problem and you want to speak directly with Todd, we're going to encourage you to call Todd at uh, area code 949-973-9140. 949-973-9140. And we'll give this phone number out in the middle of, the, of uh, this afternoon's program and then at the end. If you've got an email comment that you would like to make, send your email to recoveryradiosd at gmail.com. That's recoveryradiosd at gmail.com. I 
began my journey in sobriety three years ago. It was May 1st, 2007, after a long battle of um, prescription medication abuse, heroin, cocaine, and alcohol. And during that period of time, I'm married with three children. I know that there, there was just chaos in my family. What we wanted to do this week is discuss the family issues that surround the addict. So we are very pleased to have a special guest from Pacific Hills with us today. His name is Norm Boshoff. Todd, would you like to introduce Norm, and then we're going to get into the program. We've got a specific topic for this afternoon's program. Yeah, I'd love to introduce him. Norm Boshoff has been working with Pacific Hills for about eight years. He has been directing our transitional care program. He's also worked with our family members. Norm, would you kind of give us a rundown on your experiences and what brought you to Pacific Hills? Sure. Thanks, Todd. My name is Norm Boshoff, a native of South Africa. I came over to the States to prepare for the ministry when I was 21 years old. Ended up spending the next 14 years in education. Uh, I was called uh, to a pastorate in Albuquerque, New Mexico, as an ordained Southern Baptist pastor, and spent the next 13 years there, but along the way became an alcoholic. And that took me out of the ministry. I got into recovery and have now just celebrated 18 years of continuous sobriety. And uh, helping other people to a solution of their problems has become a passion for me. So eight years ago, I was given this opportunity at Pacific Hills Treatment Center, and I grabbed it with both hands and have happily been a part of the staff there for the last eight years. Well, I know I've enjoyed working with you in the time that I've known you at Pacific Hills. Uh, Today, we've asked Norm to talk to us on family roles and the systems that are involved there. Thanks for coming in, Norm. Thanks for having me. Well, there's many questions that people may have as as they're listening to this program, and I would imagine that one that, that comes up often, Norm, I've done everything to stop my wife or my husband or my son or my daughter from drinking. You have no idea what lengths I've gone to to do that. What am I doing wrong? That is probably one of the most puzzling questions that a family member can have. Because as our loved one begins to disintegrate before our eyes, whether that be a spouse or a child, we kick into uh, an emergency role. Uh, Their lives are out of control we are good controllers. Our life is in perfect order. We're going to come alongside and we're going to help them. One day I was teaching a family group, and I asked them to make a list of the things they had done to try to help their loved ones stop drinking and using. Mm. And these are some of the things that they threw out. And they said, uh, well, we've poured out their liquor. We've hidden it. We've hidden the money that might pay for it. We've even taken a few drinks ourselves in order to have less for the alcoholic. Most of us have argued, we've whined, bargained, threatened, walked out, come back, given them ultimatums, refused to carry them out, or carried them out, felt guilty, tried to reason with them, scheduled their free time, monitored their behavior. We've complained, we've prayed, we've tried to avoid anything that may cause the alcoholic to drink. We've searched for opportunities to make the alcoholic see the destructive nature of his drinking, and mostly we hurt we worried. We changed our circumstances, our clothes, our friendships, locations, our church, practically everything about ourselves. But nothing seems to have had the lasting impact on our suffering. And that's the usual stories of most people trying to help the alcoholic. But the fact is what the family member is trying to do is trying to control the impossible. They're trying to control a disease. And you cannot control a disease by all of your complaining and so on. Family members also feel very guilty about their loved one's disease. One of the principal uh, mantras of recovery for a family member are the three C's. We've got to remember we didn't cause it, we can't cure it, and we can't control it. We didn't cause it. This is a biogenetic disease passed on probably through the genes. We had nothing to do with it. We can't control it. There's no way that we can control another human being. They are free agents. They can make their own choices, and we certainly can't cure it. Very often I work with wives who will visit their husbands in hospital. They say, honey, I'm sorry I've gained all this weight. I'll go on a diet. I'm sorry I've spent all the money. I'll go for uh, counseling and spending, cut up the credit cards. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't keep the house as clean. 
And I say to them, you know, would you do that if he were in hospital with a heart attack? Honey, if you'll just get up out of this bed, I'll lose weight, change clothes, and so on and so on. You can't, you can't do that uh, with a disease. And so if you remember those three things, I didn't cause it, I can't cure it, and I can't control it. I think it also helps to remember the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Someone else said, God, grant me the serenity to accept the people I cannot change, and that's all the people, Mm -hmm. the courage to change the person I can, and the wisdom to know that person is me. You're listening to 1210 AM KPRZ, a brand new radio program about addictions and recovery. Uh, With us this afternoon is Norm Boshoff, who is one of the pastors at Pacific Hills Treatment Center. If you're driving down the road or listening to us at home today and you have questions about recovery, about maybe a, a loved one that's struggling in addiction, or if you are struggling in addiction and you want to talk to somebody at Recovery Options, we're going to encourage you to pick up the phone and dial 949-973-9140. That's 949-973-9140. Hey, Norm, talking about uh, alcoholism and addiction being a disease, um, I take telephone calls and I and it kind of you know, reminded me of a call I took just recently about a mother who called in and said their son was, her son was drinking and, and that he wasn't, wasn't going to work. And so I said, well, how's he drinking and how's he paying for it? Well, he's got a credit card. And I said, well, who's paying for the credit card? Well, his wife does. So I said, what's she doing paying for his drinking for, which is enabling, which disease goes beyond just the alcoholic. It goes to the family. Is that correct? Absolutely. Uh, This is a family disease, Todd. It's a disease that is probably passed down through the genes. It certainly runs from generation to generation. We know that it is inherited in that way. But more important than that, it is a disease that once a person contracts it and their life begins to disintegrate, this affects everybody around the person. Um, It affects every person in the family, even, for example, the children. Many families that I work with say, well, at least the kids don't know that he's got a problem. Actually, those people who work with the children say they are more attuned to the fact that daddy's got a problem or mommy's got a problem uh, than anyone else in the house. And what happens is, unconsciously, children fall into different roles. Usually the spouse becomes the codependent enabler. They're trying to fix, manage, control, protect the alcoholic trying to keep anyone from finding out uh, about this terrible thing that's happening in the home. Now, the children, they each fall into predictable roles. One of the children will typically become the hero. Uh, This is the person who feels that the atmosphere at home is so crazy, so out of control, that they go outside the home to control it. So what do they do? They become the straight-A student. Uh, They uh, become a cheerleader. Uh, they become athletes, track stars. This is the one that the teachers hold up and say, my goodness, look at this. This is a model child. And what that child is really trying to do is get control over something, uh, get some recognition, get some praise. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got the child who becomes the scapegoat. This is the child who may become the rebel, may become an alcoholic addict themselves. This is the one who gets failing grades, who figures that, well, Bad att- uh, getting negative attention is better than no attention at all. So they'll misbehave. Uh, they will become, in a sense, the juvenile delinquent. Then you'll get another child who becomes the lost child. This is the child who just feels so confused, so overwhelmed by the dysfunction in the home that they retreat into the wallpaper. They go into their room. They spend all the time on the computer in their books. They're lonely, loners, isolators. Uh, They have no friends. Usually this type of child becomes very close to animals, doesn't know how to socialize. And then finally you get the the clown. (laughs) This is the person who feels that the family tension is so constantly overwhelming 
that they have to relieve it somehow, and they provide uh, the comic relief. And these are the ways that the entire family seems to just be um, twisted and warped through the disease of alcoholism. I would say that I was an isolated clown in my family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they usually, families will often mention a blend of these characteristics. You're listening to 1210 AM KPRZ Recovery Radio for San Diego. Any other questions for our special guest this week? Um, well, about the child. Um, a lot of people know that their child is using or is having problems with drugs and alcohol, but tend to blame it on the people that they are associated with and don't want to take a look at their own personal situation. How do you address that issue with the parent? Thanks, Leslie. That question goes to the issue of denial. Uh, Sometimes the, the truth is too hard to face. For example, the family may say to themselves, well, if he's an alcoholic addict, what does that say about me as a parent? I must have been a bad parent. And rather than face the truth that their child has a disease, they will look for something to blame, scapegoating. The alcoholic addict isn't the only one who suffers from the denial. Uh, The codependent does also. And so they start to look for something to blame it on. And they'll blame it on friends or they'll blame it on anything like that. But the truth is uh, the disease will continue to go on even if you move to another location. Uh, I say, you know, Johnny isn't uh, isn't misbehaving because of the people he's hanging around with. He's hanging around people who misbehaves because that's the crowd he feels most comfortable with. So even if you pick up and move cross-country, you're going to find he's going to get the same sort of friends where he goes on the other side. And the fact is that the child has developed the disease of addiction. And what happens is once this takes place, the regular friends start to fall away. And the child begins to look for people who use drugs and drink alcohol just like he does. And we call this activity seeking out lower companions because our good friends leave us. And so we start to sink to the level of these other people. And as this disease progresses, because it is a progressive disease, eventually your child becomes the lower companion that other people look down on and say, if I ever get as bad as him or her, I'll go to treatment. You're listening to 1210 AM KPRZ. This is Recovery Radio for San Diego, a radio program devoted to uh, addiction topics and recovery. I would like to ask Norm one last question. A lot of us alcoholics and addicts, we get to a point where we're struggling and praying and trying to figure out, I want to get through this. God, please help me get through this. And it doesn't seem like I'm getting an answer. I start to wonder, and I hear hundreds of other people on the phones who's, who feel that God has left them, and they're, they're wondering what's happened. Can you expand on that, Norm? Yeah, this is probably one of the most frustrating experiences of most Christians. One of the things that always used to bother me as pastor is people who would step into the aisle and come down to the front for special prayer, saying, Pastor, I have a problem with drugs, I have a problem with alcohol, and uh, we would even anoint them and pray for them, and expect a miracle from God, and nothing seemed to happen. When I got into trouble with alcohol, I deeply believed in God and the power of God, and I laid hold of God in the most sincere, desperate way I knew how, and I couldn't stop drinking, and I became bitterly disappointed. I thought, God, I've served you all of these years, and I've really laid down my life for you. And in my moment of greatest crisis, when I asked for their marriage and this person's finances and the healing or restoration of this child, I could see you come through with miracles. When I asked you for this tiny little favor to help the man in the pulpit get over his alcohol, you dropped me. And I was angry with God. When I got into recovery, I wanted absolutely nothing to do with God because I thought he didn't care or he didn't have the power. Today, I'll tell you this, after 18 years of sobriety, I believe that my sobriety is 100% dependent on the power of the Lord. A lot of addicts that I work with, they they come into treatment and they say, well, I, I can't seem to find God. I seek God. I can't feel God. I think God is angry with me. I think God is forsaken with me. And I love to turn to Scripture there, uh, Luke chapter 15. It's a conversation about the nature of God. 
you have the scribes and the Pharisees on the one hand, and they're talking among themselves, and you have the Lord Jesus on the other hand, but Jesus is hanging around with the pimps and the prostitutes and the drug addicts and the dealers. And the scribes and Pharisees are having this conversation with themselves. They're saying, look at this fellow. Uh, he claims to be godly. He claims to be God. But look who he hangs with. <laughs> Birds of a feather flock together. Come on. You can tell a man by the company he keeps. And Jesus, knowing what they were talking about, looks at them and says, you know, your problem is you don't understand the nature of God. And then the Bible says he told them this parable. The word is singular. And this parable consists of three stories. It's the lost sheep the lost coin, and the lost son. The lost sheep is the shepherd who goes out and comes in at night and takes inventory of the sheep, and the number is 99 instead of 100. It's late at night, and he's exhausted, and instead of saying, oh, I'll take it as a tax write-off, that shepherd leaves the 99, and he goes up, exhausted as he is, and searches until he finds the lost sheep. The lesson that Jesus is pointing out is that we value lost things. Things that are important to us, we value them. The second story is about the lost coin, the woman who loses the coin. And, of course, this is very valuable to her. It has great sentimental value. And what does she do when she loses it? She lights the lantern and sweeps diligently and looks until she finds it. Lesson, we value lost things. The third story that all of these are leading up to is the lost son, the prodigal. I like to think of him as the drug addict alcoholic who asks dad for the credit card and the early inheritance and goes into the far country and gets drunk and loaded and wasteful, and then he hits bottom. His bottom is a pig pen. And in his bottom, in his desperation, he remembers the father's house. He remembers better days. And he says, I wonder if dad will take me back. And he begins the long journey back, and the whole way back he's planning his eloquent repentance speech, how he, his charming words and persuasive arguments will convince Dad to take him back to the house. And here's where the story gets real interesting, and I say to the men, as he approached the farm, who saw who first? And the Bible is very clear. The father saw the son. Why? The father was looking for the son. The father didn't discount the son, write him off, forget about him. Here was a father looking for him. And I say to the men, you know, before you came to treatment, God was here, scanning the horizon with eager anticipation, looking for you. When are you going to come home? I say when the father saw the son, who ran to meet the other one? Of course, it was the father who ran to meet the son because God loves him. And before the son could offer a single word of his eloquent speech of repentance, the father fell on his neck, kissed him, embraced him, restored him to sonship, and celebrated with a party. And that is the picture of God that Jesus paints. He says, the reason I'm hanging around with these pimps and prostitutes and drug addicts and alcoholics is that these are God's kids and God values What's important? The voice you're hearing is Norm Boshoff, who is one of the many pastors at Pacific Hills Treatment Center located up in the San Juan Capistrano area. You're listening to 1210 AM KPRZ, a radio program dedicated to addiction and recovery. We haven't given our telephone number yet, and we'll do that, but we've got some exciting news to talk to to everybody about, and that would be the scholarship opportunities that we have with Recovery Radio here on 1210 AM KPRZ. Well, you know, Pacific Hills is helping to sponsor this um, program on the radio, and so what we've done is is put together a scholarship program that is geared towards the churches and their congregation and local businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what those scholarships are and how people can uh, apply for them and, and qualify for them or to participate them even better, um, you can give me a call at 949-973-9140. And I'll say that again, 949-973-9140. If you've got questions, you need help, need prayer, call 949 973 
9140. That's 949 973 9140. All this week, we have Norm with us. Tomorrow, we'll pick up the show and talk a little bit more about codependency. But thank you for coming in this afternoon, Norm. Thanks, John. You're welcome. We'll see you tomorrow on 1210 AM KPRZ. Recovery Radio San Diego on KPRZ featuring Todd Cunningham of Pacific Hills Treatment Center and Recovery Options Network and John and Leslie Savage. Call Todd for help and resources now at 949-973-9140 or email recoveryradiosandiego at gmail.com. Tell a friend to listen. Recovery Radio San Diego, sponsored by John Savage. Hope and answers for Christian families, 6.30 p.m. daily on KPRZ.